good morning or afternoon or evening, whenever you're watching this. We're so glad that you are here with us. Uh, this is Northminster Presbyterian Church in Tucson in our online service. I'm Julia, and I just want to welcome you to worship today. Uh, I'm going to be reading Psalm 98 uh, for our call to worship. I'm going to be reading the message version of this psalm. Um, I really like the message translation sometimes just to kind of, I don't know, like reignite scripture in my mind. It just, you know, hearing it in a slightly different um, version can make it seem fresh and new again, even a scripture that I've read a lot. So this is Psalm 98, or parts of it, from the message. Sing to God a brand new song. He has made a world of wonders. He rolled up his sleeves. He set things right. God made history with salvation. He showed the world what he could do. Shout your praises to God, everybody. Let loose and sing. Strike up the band. Round up an orchestra to play for God. Add on a hundred voice choir. Feature trumpets and big trombones. Fill the air with praises to King God. Let the sea and its fish give a round of applause with everything living on earth joining in. Let oceans call out encore and mountains harmonize the finale. A tribute to God when he comes when he comes to set the earth right. He'll straighten out the whole world. He'll put the world right and everyone in it. So if you have uh, your trombone ready, bust it out, you can play along with us this morning. Um, but no, in re it really, I hope that you will sing with us today um, from your home or wherever you're listening um, and pray with me uh, before we do that. Dear God, we just thank you and praise you this morning. We thank you for scripture that you've given us to meditate on, to learn more about you. God, we ask that you would be with us um, right now, wherever we are, that you would help us to put aside distractions, to focus on you, to bring you glory with our worship today. God, whether we are singing or playing a trombone or a drum, we know that you love to hear our worship. And God, we pray that prayer this morning that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first two songs this morning are going to be a song called Great Things and then Living Hope. Bye. 
Welcome, friends. I'm Andy Ross, and along with Julia and our praise team, we want to welcome you to this service of worship. Uh, as Julia said, whether it's this morning or later on in the day or this week, or whether you're listening to this service on KGMS radio, we profoundly believe that it's the Holy Spirit of the living God that connects us even when we can't physically be together it's God's Spirit who makes us family. And as we just sang, Jesus Christ is our living hope. And just one of the reasons we worship and sing praise to God is for us on this side of heaven to steep ourselves in that factual reality. Jesus has won. Jesus is winning. In Jesus Christ, we have a peace and a life secure in his cross, resurrection, and life with us now. So we're so glad you are joining. We hope and pray uh, that this service will be a blessing and an encouragement for you as we direct our praise to the living God. Just a few announcements. Uh, I want to encourage you. To, it just takes a minute to fill out that communication card. You go up to the edge and just click on it. Let us know that you were in worship with us, and you can also share a comment, a prayer request, or a praise. We love reading through those, hearing from you, and praying for you uh, during the week. Uh, we say this every week, but if you go to our website, uh, there's an array of online resources, uh, classes that are happening. If you click on that bulletin link, or on the YouVersion Bible app, you'll see some of those classes that are available, some of them happening this morning, Sunday. Uh, we're continuing our food outreach on Monday nights at 5.30. It's a swing-by, grab-and-go, uh, good meal. Uh, we have free face masks. On Tuesday morning, our Deacon's Pantry on the south side of our campus also has a groceries to help you get by. We'll, we'll pray with you. Uh, so it's a walk-through kind of a thing. That's at 9 a.m. Tuesday morning. Encourage you to come by if you need that added help. We, um, uh, we have a pastoral phone line, uh, and it's there on our bulletin. If you need someone to talk to or you want to leave a message for prayer and just intercession, please call us. We want to be here for you and to connect with you and to support you. Our clean air project is underway. We received a number of uh, designated gifts. We're going to be uh, installing in our whole church ionization air filtration devices, which will significantly improve our air quality. Uh, so it, thank you for those gifts. Uh, we really appreciate it. Also, um, we have... Uh, this morning I want to mention our middle school and high school ministries because in a moment I'm going to introduce to you Sean Farrell, our director of student ministries. We have a middle school and high school youth group on Tuesday and Wednesday evenings. We're meeting via Zoom for these days, but you can learn about that on our bulletin website. You can register and get involved also on Sunday mornings at 9.30. There's a Zoom Sunday school class for uh, I used to call them junior hires. Have you ever heard that term? Yeah, junior hires. Yeah, yeah, great times, junior high. So, uh, whatever your age, I hope you're finding ways. I know it's an awkward and challenging season we're in, but it's key that you're staying connected. After worship, at 12.30 p.m., we have a Zoom cyber fellowship. Uh, you need to contact us to register, but it's just a half an hour to say hello to one another, uh, smile, make some friends, and check in. Hope you're staying connected. Hope you're staying well. Wash your hands. Wear your masks. It needs to go over the nose, okay? And um, 
live in that victory and that joy of Jesus Christ. I, I do want to invite uh, Mr. Sean Farrell up. Sean is one of my colleagues in ministry here. He's an awesome guy, and uh, he's going to lead us.
to my soul mountain high valley low i'm gonna sing wherever i go all my life all i know god's been good good to my soul mountain high valley low i'm gonna sing wherever i go Oh, sorry, I, I didn't realize I still had my mask on. Hey kids, how's it going? Uh, again, I'm Sean. I didn't realize that my mic was not on, but you know, God hears our prayers no matter what, right? So, that was an awesome song. But, how many of you guys have ever heard the saying, you don't know what you got till it's gone? Alright, yeah, I mean I have, yeah, Pastor Andy has. Um, so if someone told me, you know, way back in January that I'd be wearing one of these masks for three to four months out of the year and maybe half the year I wouldn't be able to interact with my friends or family, I think they were crazy. Um, but today, Pastor Andy is going to be preaching and he's actually talking about a similar story. Um, so in John chapter 16, Jesus is telling his disciples about how he's going to leave them and then come back and then leave them again, and they're kind of confused. Just like I would have been confused in January if someone said, hey, you're going to be leaving your friends and then coming back to them and then potentially leaving them again. So it didn't make any sense to me. Um, but the great news is, the great news is, is that God um, has a plan for us. So uh, again, if you would have told me this, I would have thought, oh man, but I wouldn't have known that I would have been able to spend more time with my friends after this quarantine. So uh, we're using these masks as a way to help us, but also to help our friends so that we can get back to a relationship with our friends. So what I want you guys to do is, this quarantine's kind of a bummer, right? I don't know about you guys, I don't know how many of you guys have actually hung out with your friends yet, um, but soon, soon you'll be able to go back to kind of your normal life, maybe even go back to school um, and get to hang out with your friends. And so what I want you guys to do now is, is during the service, I want you guys to think about, think about a friend that you maybe didn't say goodbye to uh, way back in March or February that you haven't seen or talked to in a while. Um, 
and, and think about them and reach out to them today or this week. And just say, hi, how are you? How are you doing? Because again, Jesus was telling the disciples that he's going to leave them, but he's going to come back. And he's going to have that relationship with us. And that we get to have that relationship later on with all of our friends in heaven. So, I want you guys to take today, while Pastor Andy's uh, preaching, and think about that friend that maybe you want to reach out to. And reach out to him this week, or today. All right? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. Uh, for you, your son, and all the friends that we have in our lives. Lord, this quarantine is kind of a bummer. It doesn't let us hang out with our friends, with our family. Uh, but we know that uh, what you have is greater than all of that. And that one of these days we will be back hanging out with them. Whether it's here on earth or in heaven with you. And we know that that is going to be awesome. In your name we pray. Amen. We put the fun in dysfunctional. You ever hear that? Ever hear somebody describe their family that way? Just just mine? Okay. Uh some of you know I grew up in that Mayberry, Andy Griffith, uh, bucolic rural life in Ohio, and we had family reunions. Y'all have family reunions, family gatherings. Uh, they're a bit challenged these days. Uh, my family back in Ohio was so extensive, once a year we would rent out the Green County Fairgrounds. No joke. And there'd be croquet and softball and games and potluck and coleslaw and potato salad and cheek pinching. Ow, you're growing so fast. And you know, I protested when I was a kid going to these things, but they were really mega fun. And I miss them to this day. Here at Northminster Church, Family matters. Family is huge. And, and it's why we've been working in these past weeks not only to bring you our online ministries and worship, but we're also working on trying to carefully figure out how we might begin to have some in-person gatherings again with great carefulness and protocols. Maybe next month in August, we'll see. And we are committed to continuing for you our online digital ministries. Uh, I, it just We are so thankful to God. We've had so many worship connections and fellowship digitally. We're connecting with folks in Wisconsin, uh, Nebraska, uh, uh, Arkansas, um, Amsterdam, Africa. And, and we thank God for that. I thank God for Chris Yamanaka, our our tech minister and our steeple light audio video team every week volunteering. Uh, thank you so much, friends. And we're committed to continuing our online ministries for months and months and months to come. But becoming reunited in a family gathering, it's what Sean was talking about. It's one of the greatest joys you can experience. And Jesus wants to talk about this joy and how we can hold on to it, especially when we need it. So we've been looking at the Gospel of John. We're continuing that today. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 16. Jesus is teaching, and at verse 17 we read, At this some of his disciples said to one another, What does he, Jesus, mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. When Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. 
You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will will be complete. Can we pray? God, we thank you for this reading of your word. Thank you, Lord. Help us now, Holy Spirit. Please help me with my words. Help us with our listening that we would encounter you, Jesus, and follow you in faith. Amen. Peekaboo! Peekaboo! Yeah! It's one of my favorite games. Love it. And, and I know that my jokes, I know that my jokes cannot compare to Pastor Ken Skodiak's. And for that, I'm so thankful. Uh, but I have to tell you that when it comes to babies, I am a Jerry Seinfeld. I am a black belt master of peekaboo, and I can make a baby smile and usually laugh and laugh. I can carry the room. And here's why the game of peekaboo works so well with little humans and also with grown-up Christians. It's a principle of cognitive human development called object permanence, object permanence. And so, friends, for example, if you're worshiping with us today and you're older than seven months of age, you're likely not struggling with object permanence and the physical principles therein. For example, if I do this, I'm still here. Surprise! And if you're older than seven months of age, you weren't too worried about that. Yeah, exactly. It's called object permanence. You hide a toy under the covers, and a child who is older knows that it didn't just disappear. It's still there, but hidden, and they'll go looking for it. You hide my chocolate in the house, and I will rip apart the pantry to find it. Dogs have a limited ability of object permanence. Sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't. Did you know that crows, above all animals, crows are the masters of object permanence. They know if it's hidden and where to find and hide it. That gives them something to crow about. But how does object permanence turn into rock-solid faith when it comes to human life and death? When it comes to something you treasure, someone you treasure being removed from your life, how can we find family joy then? It comes from a principle of faith, faith development that I call Savior permanence. Jesus wanted to make sure his followers lived their lives with a Savior permanence faith for all that was ahead of them. And I believe the same is true for you and for me today. You know, over these past weeks, we have been looking at the Gospel of John in worship, uh, these passages called the Farewell Discourses, where Jesus teaches, prays, and shares many guiding words with disciples before his arrest and execution. And, and I want to say this with no disrespect, but what Jesus would do in Jerusalem in human history with his arrest, death, 
and subsequent resurrection and ascension would be God's biggest peekaboo of all time. It would be the actual glorious intervention of the living God on humanity's behalf that would not simply put a hidden toy back into our hands, but it would restore our lives and loved ones. It's the guarantee of a new heaven and a new earth held out for us to enjoy in our Savior today. Jesus is the root of real joy for us today. And it comes from us in Savior permanence. Right. Jesus explained to his friends, he said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. And here's, I think, how the disciples read these words from their master. And you've got to love the honesty reality of the Bible account. And the disciples essentially said, you know, we don't understand. What does he mean? Now, note this. What Jesus was going to do had not happened yet. And how could these followers uh, understand a victorious Savior King who would win the battle by dying? How could they understand Jesus going to the Father and yet promising to return? How could they fathom a Messiah given to them only to be taken away and then reappear? And today, friends, how do we comprehend and get resurrection? Human death itself being defeated. Life becoming restored. And so Jesus explains uh, this promise that would change their lives and I believe is changing history as we know it. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Now there's two sections here I want you to notice. Uh, the first is how it begins, amen, amen. Uh, uh, or in the original language, it's amen, amen, which is Jesus and the old world way of saying, listen, this is true and important. Jesus does this from time to time, and, and so as you, I want you to watch for it in your Bible reading. It, it's Jesus' way of saying, all right, all right, amen, amen, listen up. But secondly, look at the latter portion of this text. There's a promise here that Jesus is offering. He says, you will grieve. And in fact, by the way, Jesus is meaning you will often grieve over things that this world takes joy in. Uh, uh, any, of you, any of you remember that old country song, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden? Jesus never said, follow me and there will always be roses. No, no. There are thorns with today's roses. Jesus received thorns. But look at this. He goes on to say, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Your grief will turn to joy. Now, here's my question. Do you believe that? Are you banking on it? And are you experiencing it? What is this joy? And can we experience this joy now, this side of heaven, here in Mudville? To answer those questions, let's explore joy just for a moment. J-O-Y. Years ago, when I was a young Christian, I was taught that the real joy for someone who puts their trust in God through Jesus, that joy is spelled this way. J is for Jesus. 
you put Jesus first in your life, there is a calming contentment of God that comes to you when you seek to put Jesus first in your heart, in your life experiences, uh, really first in whatever you're facing. J is for Jesus, your never failing savior, your shepherd. No matter how dark your valley is that you're going through, he's got you, he's with you, and he's leading you to pastures of restoration. He is. I'm guessing right now that there is someone listening to this who is right now in a great deal of pain. Or you may be just in a swamp of fears or anxiety. Uh, and, and anxiety is, has been taking a toll on you. Friends, please hear me. You have a friend in Jesus. He is with you. He wants to help you, comfort you, guide you through this. Whatever you're facing, let Him lead. Lean on Jesus. Listen for Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. Putting Jesus first is a life orientation that means becoming baptized, making a faith decision, and allowing God's Spirit to work in you from the inside out. Put J first. The second letter of joy, of joy is O, and that stands for others. Suddenly now, the Jesus spirit and mission in you is about those 8 to 15 or so regulars in your life. They might, li they might live near you. They might live with you. You see them weekly uh, where you go, even behind masks. They're there. How are you engaging with them, caring for them, praying for them, sharing your faith and heart with them? Right. The third letter of joy is Y, which stands for you. Your joy includes you, growing each day as a child of light. That's how the New Testament describes disciples of Jesus. With God's help, you're becoming the real you you were meant to be, which includes how God has made you so unique, has gifted you in such special ways. But friends, this sequence is what's key. I, I can tell you from personal experience, when I start a day uh, thinking only about myself first, I am the grumpy Andy. I am the selfish, unpleasant. I'm that Snickers commercial Andy that I'm not supposed to be. Right. If you take the Jesus, the J out of your joy, you're just living with oi. Oi, they. And if you forget about Jesus and others, it's just why, and you're living your life. Why? Exactly. Exactly. Jesus says, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Now quickly now, I want us to explore from text in our reading how this grief into joy process works. The first step we should notice is the power of awaiting joy. And here's a simple concept, and it helps me. Simply awaiting the certainty of something good helps me feel better now, right? And so the key to awaiting joy is endurance. If I know with certainty that something good is coming, I can endure hardship much longer. And boy, does Jesus use a powerful metaphor here for waiting, a childbirth. Right. Now, now, I want to be very careful here because I am a man. And secondly, I'm a man who has never experienced giving birth to another human. But I've been told that childbirth is not a simple, easy-peasy process. Uh, someone once said to me, you know, childbirth is like taking your lower lip and pulling it up over your forehead. But, but here's the deal, friends. Do mothers who have had a child, a baby, do they only show photos of their pain? <laughs> do, 
Do they only focus on their contractions? Do they only have pictures of their grimaces and anguish? No. Jesus says a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. Now, Jesus uses the word forgets <laughs> about the pain of childbirth. Uh, ladies, I'm going to let you all take that up with Jesus, okay? I'm just going to leave that. But his point here is the focus of the joy of childbirth is this new life, not the pain. And so, friends, we find real joy when we look with endurance to what's coming, the glorious hope of God who was born for us, born to save. The second element of grief into joy is the power of asking joy. You know, when I'm struggling and scraping by looking for my mojo, I can recover joy if I ask for help. Now, even as I wrote this message my, uh, this past week, my wife headed out to the grocery store, mask ready, and I slipped in some requests for chocolate and for those flavor twist barbecue lovely snack items made by the nutritional caregivers at Frito-Lay. Bless them. And my wife delivered. Yes. And so the key to asking joy is the power of intercession. When you know someone can help you, who can be there to be with you, who wants to pray for you, assist you, ask. Jesus mentions this to his friends. He says, until now you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. What a promise. Now, let's be clear about Jesus' words. He says, you will receive. He does not specify that you will receive exactly what you're asking for. You know, Garth Brooks, I seem to be in a country music frame of mind. Garth Brooks has a wonderful song about thanking God for unanswered prayers. I encourage you to check that out this week. But when an immature but earnest child asks a parent for something, we all know that that parent should never just give the child whatever she asks for, but if it is a loving parent, the child will receive. The child will receive caring attention, wisdom, and a guiding, helpful response for what they best need. And so, there's asking joy. You know, um, I don't know if I've told you about Oscar the Brave, our miniature dachshund. Oscar is an 11-pound, wire-haired, fierce mini wiener dog, and he is willing to charge at any dove that comes within uh, so many feet of our backyard. Uh, we have never had a dove invading or taking over our home because of Oscar. He is the great white orca of bird guardians. Doves of southern Arizona fear Oscar. But a week ago, July 4th weekend, with the fireworks and the booming and the popping all night long, Oscar was Mr. Chicken. He was just shaking. There was a moment where he was at my feet. You could see him shaking, and he's looking at me with pleading eyes. I pick him up, hold him, sit down. I can just feel his body trembling. And he even puts one of his legs around my arm to hold me. You know, Jesus tells us to ask him when we're shaking. Ask Him to hold us. Just be with us. It's how we find ourselves to a new way of joy. And thirdly, along with awaiting joy and asking joy, there's animating joy. And this is the power of God's Spirit enlivening us, keeping us going from within. It's about the new you becoming with God's Spirit in you. 
It's, it's God's Spirit animating you and getting the best of you when you want to quit. And, and I want to demonstrate by uh, uh, using one of my favorite animated characters. Tigger is one of my heroes. And, and I love Tigger because he bounces. He's the bounciest of the bouncers. And you can wonder, what's the wonderful thing about Tiggers? Well, it's true that their Tiggers are wonderful things and that they have springs in their tails, but really what makes Tiggers bounce are their batteries and the animator who draws them. How are God's batteries in you? How do you need God's Spirit to redraw you today? C.S. Lewis once said, Faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has accepted in spite of your changing moods. And C.S. Lewis knew what he was talking about. He served at a time when a world war decimated his city, London. He lived at a time when he and his family and friends would social distance every night down into lower basements with dimmed lights because of German bombing raids destroying structures above. He saw his friends and companions killed in trench warfare. And the hardest for him, it was his joy, Joy Davidman, his wife and the love of his life would at last succumb to cancer. And C.S. Lewis struggled in a season of questioning and deep grief, but at last he was able to come through and give thanks to God that God allowed him to experience this gift of amazing love. And in all of this, C.S. Lewis, in all that he experienced in life hardships, he could truly claim this truth. Faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. How are your changing moods these days? And if you're like me, your emotions aren't always staying in the lane you're supposed to be driving in. But friends, here's the bigger question. How are you finding the family joy that comes from the family and faith of Jesus Christ? And how can we encourage the joy of Christ with each other as the family of God? I love this story that was told by Yvonne Dilling she once shared about the joy she experienced as a Christian aid worker from Indiana. There was a time when she was down in Honduras helping Christian Salvadoran refugees fight for their lives. They had just crossed the river. They had been running for their lives from the strafing bullets of attack helicopters. She was helping them set up a camp in Honduras. And she noticed that as they set up their little camp, they immediately formed three committees, a construction committee, an education committee, and the Comité de Alegria, the Committee of Joy. She was struck by these Christian refugees who had been running for their lives that celebrating and lifting up each other's spirits was as basic to their life as digging latrines and teaching their children how to read. Our help comes from awaiting joy, endurance, from asking joy, intercession and from God's animating joy, His Spirit enlivening us and among us. And friends, here's the best part. The best part of all this, this is not all based on you. Never has been. It's all grounded. In fact, given and guaranteed through Jesus. Look at how he wraps up this teaching in the chapter 16 of John, Jesus closes by saying, do you now believe a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered each to your own home 
You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. For me, those last words have lived in me for many years through a very simple chorus I learned years ago in youth ministry. (laughs) And uh, it's so old and long ago, it's probably new for most of you. But I love this simple little chorus. And it's not just a way to memorize Scripture, but uh, I'd like to teach it to you and have you sing with me. And I hope it's a way for this tune and the words of our Savior to come into your heart. And I hope that it sings and reverberates for you through this week, through all your days. It goes like this. These things I have spoken encourage you to learn this and sing it out loud with me, all right? These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. this week. Be of the good cheer of our Savior. Seek His joy. Find endurance because of the promises of God. Live with God's Spirit animating you from the inside out. Jesus, others, yourself. May the blessings of God the Father, may the grace of his ever-living Son, Jesus the Christ, and may the power and the peace of God's Holy Spirit be with you and guide you today and into eternity. Amen.